Jesus, come on. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Yes, he does. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Yes, he does. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. a church in South Florida. We were in Delray Beach, so. But when we came up here, we tried a couple of little churches, and it's hard to pinpoint what you're looking for exactly in a church. But when you feel that connection, you know that it's the right place. Well, here's one piece of it, is that a lot of people want to talk, and I say people like the pastor or the preacher, they want to talk about like the the good stuff and the the feel good stuff and the positive stuff that right. everybody wants to listen right. to. Right. But really, there's the the dark stuff, the other side of it that the stuff you, people are really carrying. The stuff that yeah. people are carrying. And the the yeah. devil really is at work here, and it's it's messing with things. It's messing with my life, and I see it in my kids when they come home yeah. from you know whatever. Here I am giving myself goosebumps now. But that's what you want to hear. You want to know that like we can acknowledge that we don't have to be afraid of it. This is a huge piece of our world. This is yeah. our world. What you're saying makes so much sense. Think of it in a different context. Would you send any t- troop, group of troops into a, a battle, which is what we're in? Right. Having no mention of the enemy, having right. no mention of... That would be insanity, right? Right. But in, in a way, like, that's kind of what you're describing. Like, if, if all you were to do is just sit around and just cheerlead all the time and stuff. Yes. This is, there's, a, there's a dereliction of duty yeah. in that. Yeah. And also a lack of genuineness. Yeah. And it doesn't pass the smell test, does it? It's so funny. Our daughter came home from one of the churches... And I go, hey, how was service? And she goes, I don't know, it was okay. Like, we just played the whole time. And you'd think from a kid, like, I just want to play all the time. But she was, like, not sold on it because it was just not, that's not what church is to her. Church, she wants to learn. And this is a kid who loves to play, too. It's not like she's this, like, serious bookworm. (laughs) But she was just, like, not about all the play. But she's eight. And you also get the impression more and more that that all that, like, Mickey Mouse stuff, all that, like, fooling around stuff, that's old. It's yesterday. Yes. But that's really what I think. Yeah. I think that's old wineskins yesterday, not what's in front of us and not what people are hungry for. If you want to hunker down in anything that's truth, you have, you're, you're choosing to be a colony 
in a land that is hostile to you. You want to know that you're doing that with people. Mm-hmm. You want to know that they're aware of it. Yep. You want them to be praying about that. You want them to be rearing their children with a similar goal, all that stuff. You want more than just this like thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just a yeah. place to show up anymore. I think, but community is such a such an important part of it too. And it I'll is. tell you, from coming from other churches and coming from South Florida and coming from, we've we've hopped around a bunch of times at churches, and this is the first church that we've been to in a couple of years that has been feels strong, it feels connected. People are looking you in the eye, smiling yeah. as they come and go. And believe it or not, that is not the case at all churches. Some people are like avoiding eye contact, or they're still so in their head, or they've got their own problems going on and they don't bring themselves to Sunday with like the ability to open up at least I now more than ever just crave that community connection and Me just too. just a hello and a place to come together it's so important we're so much weaker alone mm-hmm. scripture says that we are Good morning and welcome to Encounter Church. We are so glad that you are here worshiping with us today. Here is your Sunday morning touch point. Are you looking for ways to serve here at Encounter Church? The first way that you can get involved is with our junior high impact youth ministry. And if you are interested in being a youth leader or helping out with the youth group, make sure that you reach out to Emma at EncounterChurchOfPalmyra.org. Or if you see Emma, stop by and talk to her. And the second option for getting involved is back in our Kids Connection area. We have so many new families, so many new children that are coming. It's such a blessing. If you feel a calling on your heart to help back in Kids Connection, please reach out to the church office or stop by Kids Connection and talk to Maria, Steph, or Jill. On Friday, August 18th at 7 p.m. here at the church, we will be having a worship and prayer night. We hope that you will come out to this event and bring your entire family. Child care will be provided at 7 p.m. on the 18th. There will be a men's breakfast on Saturday, August 19th here at the church. A $10 donation is also suggested to cover the cost of food, but is not mandatory. On Tuesday, August 15th from 6 to 8 p.m. here at the church is our foster care and adoption group. For more information about the group or to simply ask any questions, email Samantha G. Kiefer at gmail.com or go to the church website and click on the link. That is your Sunday morning touch point. You can always check out any of our social media platforms and most importantly, our church website and free church app. That's your Sunday morning touch point.
there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. And he sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And he did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. For those who are dominated by the sinful nature, think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, well, we think about things that please the spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. But letting the spirit control your minds leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. And that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit if you have the spirit of the living God in you. And remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And if Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, well, he will give you life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by it, it will dictate you and you will die. But if through the power of the spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, You received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all of creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of the future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know what God causes everything to work together for those of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them glory. And what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us from whom God has chosen us for his own? 
No one for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or are destitute or are in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is yours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love, nor power in the sky above, or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
what's happening in our lives. Lord, sometimes you call us to things that we don't see, the path, but your word is a lamp unto our path and a light. You call us to be faithful and obedient. Help us, Lord. If there's anything that remains within us, remove us and replace it with all of you. We love you, Jesus. In your blessed name, amen. Right. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Right, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Right, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith. Right, I know your works, your love, and faith, and service, and patient endurance, Right. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Right. These things said the Amen. Good morning. It's a gorgeous day outside. So what are you doing in here? Well, one of the things you're doing in here is you're living out your identity. You are in all likelihood a follower of Jesus Christ. You are perhaps a disciple of Jesus. That's the way some of us put it some of the times. We are ones that are affiliated with others who believe in the Bible and believe in the Gospels and the way of Jesus. Uh, That little bumper video there used a portion of a letter. So here's what's coming over the next number of weeks. What we want to study and think about and understand is a letter written to us. The New Testament is just filled with these letters. Most of the New Testament is letters. Letters written by disciples, apostles. Some of them are unknown in their authorship, or at least it's contested. But we are describing for new believers scattered all over the world already in the New Testament era. And now they need to be reminded of who they are and to hold on to that. Well, 2,000 years later, we too need to be reminded of who we are and what we are called to be and to do. So letters to the church. And I want to give a very specific title to the nature of what we're talking about this morning. You are a resident alien. I don't know if that one bothers you or not. Uh, not, not little green men. You are a resident alien. So let me explain what that means. A long time ago, I was going to say once upon a time, but that leads you into some kind of fantasy world. So let's not go there. But a long time ago, we packed up a U-Haul truck and trailer, my wife and our daughter. We only had one at at the time. And began a journey that started in Portland, Oregon, went across the United States, crossed the border from Buffalo, New York, into Canada. And we lived there for the next eight years. And we had this label by the Canadian immigration system. You are a resident alien. It just seemed kind of odd, like a Martian of some sort. But it's the immigration system's designation. You're not a citizen. You aren't really one of us, but we sort of are okay with you living here. A resident. A resident alien. Now, as a resident alien... You had basically, in Canada at least, I don't know how other countries do this, you had both, mostly everything as part of a normal citizenry, but you could not vote. Well, I didn't know who to vote for or against anyway. So resident aliens, you, you, you could work, you weren't segregated in any way, you could do all the things. Now, you had to jump through some hoops to get there. They wanted you to be healthy. Well, Canada has a national health system. And if we're going to let you in, 
we got to make sure that you are not a drain on the system. So, had to go take a physical. Had to spend money taking the physical and other kinds of things to get you ready. Had to have a criminal background checks. We're not going to let any criminals into our country. Uh, so you go through the hoops and finally you get the letter from the Canadian immigration system that says you are approved to relocate to Canada. And so we made our way to Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. It was a good eight years there. The weird part was when we moved back to the United States, we moved to Lebanon County. I was a more of a resident alien in Lebanon County than I was in Canada. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I had no idea. Well, that's life. You adjust to it. And that's a long time too, ago too. But I, we, we had four daughters, one born in the United States before we moved, but three born in Canada. So now I got three Canadian citizens in my family. I don't know what to do with them. Well because they were born to the United States citizen parents, they, they get to have U.S. citizenship. It's kind of strange. Uh, the United States won't recognize Canadian citizenship, but Canada will recognize both. So if they want to go back, they can go anytime, no questions asked. Not a bad deal, actually. Well, we're going to talk about this notion of being a resident alien this morning. Did you know that there are between 103 and 108 million, depending on which website you look at, refugees in this world? That is a lot of people that have been forcibly removed or displaced. Most recently, think of Ukraine. War, famine, all the headaches and heartaches that go with that. And so now they are living in a different place, not by their choice, it was our choice to move to Canada, but they don't have a choice if they're going to survive and live, that's what they're going to do, move. There is a scripture I want you to listen to. This is an introduction to one of those letters written to the early church to help them understand who they are in Christ, their identity. So the book of 1 Peter begins this way, addressed to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Christ Jesus and sprinkled with his blood. So here are these people who've been forceful, forcibly removed from home, scattered all over the then known world. Those names are roughly Western Turkey in today's terms. And they are being scattered. They are exiles. And in a sense, there's no going back. This is their new home because of persecution. And 1 Peter deals a lot with the suffering of that period of time. And so as they go, Peter writes to them to remind them who they are, that they are children of God the Father, they are sanctified by the work of the Spirit, they've been sprinkled by the shed blood of Jesus. Don't forget who you really are. And we have a habit of forgetting a lot of things about who we really are. Now, I want to translate this notion of resident alien from an immigration status to then what it means to be a part of the church. The church ought to be thought of as God's resident aliens in this world. What do I mean by that? Well, we've been displaced in a sense, but maybe we're at the home we always knew. But what we've been called to do in Christ is to represent him wherever we are, to have that identity of being in Christ, that the Bible, is that little phrase is used frequently in the Bible. Wherever we go, whatever we do, how, how we think, how we act, what our work is, what our family is, 
all of this is to be identified as being brothers and sisters in the family of God. We are Christians. It's not a label given to us as a birthright. It is an identity that is given to us by faith in Jesus Christ. And so then, as resident aliens in this world, Christians are called to live for Christ in a non-Christian environment. Now, that wasn't always so. Sometimes in our past, Christians lived in a very hothouse environment where everybody was Christians. And some still think that, even though their actions and their lifestyle might not suggest it. Well, how do you live? So if we're called to be in the world, residents, but not of the world, aliens, how do you live? That's what these letters, for the most part, are all about. This was uh, made known to me in a rather shocking way. In 1969, I joined the United States Navy. The Vietnam War was raging, and it seemed to me to be a better idea to be, uh, to be out at sea than to be on land in Vietnam. I'm not sure that was true, but at least in my head I thought that. And suddenly this farm boy from North Dakota is thrust into a world of craziness that I had never encountered before. I never knew what racism was until I joined the Navy. I never knew what bad language was until I joined the Navy. Those sailors know how to speak a different language. I never knew all sorts of things about life and about living until I joined the Navy. Well, that's kind of what a disciple of Jesus is forced to do, to enter a world that is not exactly comfortable to us, but to represent the gospel of Jesus Christ, to represent Jesus himself. Now, there is another verse from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. He says to these exiles, live out your time as foreigners, just admit it, you're a foreigner here, in reverent fear. Live out your time in reverent fear, not afraid of your new culture or language or circumstance, in reverent fear to honor God in the midst of an unchristian world. You and I are called to do exactly the same today. So in a biblical sense, in a Christian sense, you are a foreigner on this world. You are in the world, but you do not belong to this world. So you're representing Jesus Christ in this world. So here's the deal. Here's the kind of the, the shape of the problem. Disciples of Christ are forever in a very precarious position. Precarious in the sense that we are walking a narrow fence. You can fall off this way. You can fall off that way. It's the whole thesis of the old musical Fiddler on the Roof trying to make music in a very precarious situation. So we are in the world, residents, but not of the world. We are aliens, so how do we live? You can fall off to the one way by adapting, by changing, by compromising, by conforming to this world to try and fit in. You know, when our oldest daughter came back to the United States, she, she was in fourth grade. And she came back home from school kind of upset because kids would make fun of her because her uh, fashion sense was Canadian developed and not United States developed. Now, it wasn't terribly noticeable, but she got um, pointed out by her girlfriends at school. And she had a little bit of a Canadian accent. Now, she lived around American parents all of her life, but had friends and began to talk like, you know, again, instead of again, the way we Americans do it, although we don't say it the way it's actually spelled. But things like that. There is a street in Harrisburg called Progress Avenue. Well, that's how they say progress, progress, progress. To them, that's the way you say it. 
Well, so you have these accents that come along and some teasing that goes with it. I hope it was all good-natured teasing. I'm not so sure. But we live in this world where we can conform and adapt to this. But Jesus says, no. You belong to the kingdom of God. You live by its ethic. You live by its calling. You are to represent Jesus to the world and tell them the good news of life and salvation in Jesus. So the church, on the one hand, can betray that and conform to the world. They want to fit in. They want to sense that they belong here. But it is rather confusing. Strangers in a strange land, who doesn't want to kind of find a way to fit in? And there's a sense in which we have to do that. There's a new word that entered our lexicon of human speech, at least in this culture, since about the mid-2010s, 2015 or so, called woke. You've heard of it. I had to go look and wikipedia to understand what it meant i kind of knew given the context of the news reports that would use this but woke became a way of describing the problems of injustice and racism trying to be awake or woke to these areas of discrimination among us and that's not all a bad thing however it has become a rallying cry for us to change our identity to fit into a world that wants to be woke in a certain way. And if you aren't being transformed into that certain way, you get, there's another word, canceled, criticized, ostracized, shut up, that kind of thing. So, fitting in on the one hand is one way we can fall off the fence, but on the other hand, we can be on the outside to such an extreme degree that we don't have any contact with the culture around us. So we remain on the outside, so conformed on the one hand, but then also alien on the other that there's no influence. That's another new word. When did I first start hearing of influencers? People who have a social media platform that want to influence me, you, the whole world, in a certain way of thinking, as they would describe it. Well, you can fall off the one way and conform. You can fall off the other way and be having no contact with the world at large around you. And that either way is not the Christian way, not our identity. We are in the world. Our values are not of the world. The message we have, the gospel, is not of the world. So we're going to start the new series. Ted will be preaching in the weeks coming along. But letters to the church. 21 of the 26 books of the New Testament are letters. And I could make an easy case that all 26 of them are letters. Why did Mark write his gospel? Well, it's to communicate with churches. But it's not written with a letter format. Well, because they need guidance, and especially under persecution, the church of Jesus Christ that began in Jerusalem and spread all over the known world at the time needs encouragement, needs guidance, needs a sense of this is how you do this. Sometimes they need correction, even serious correction. Who are we and how are we supposed to live? What are we supposed to live by? You could take Jesus as our teacher. He did the ultimate transformation to become one like us, the incarnation. And so the incarnation is to take up residence in God's provision in the flesh, and yet he is so unlike us. Imagine an encounter where you've been traveling through space maybe for gazillions of light years. I don't know. I don't know how to explain this. But you find an alien culture, one that's never been encountered before. And once you establish connection and communication, what do you want to know? Well, you might want to know how advanced their civilization is. What I want to know 
is do you have a sin problem? Or do you not know about sin? And if you have a sin problem, and I don't know how to describe this, you know, it could be crime. It could be a sense of uh, displacement from what it means to be a normal human being. But it could be all sorts of descriptions of what a sin problem is. But we are living outside of the way God created us. And if you have a sin problem, do you know what to do about it? Our culture says we've got a message that we can share with the world that says we've got a problem. And in a word, it's called sin. And what the gospel of Jesus Christ does for us is tells us here's what you can do about it. I had a coffee shop encounter with an old friend this week. As usual, when you meet somebody you haven't seen for a while, you say, hi, how are you? And she begins by saying, fine. And almost as soon as she said it, that's not true. I'm not fine. I had a cancer diagnosis recently. My son wrecked the car earlier this week. We know about trouble, don't we? To live in this world is to have trouble. In this world, Jesus said it, you will have trouble. But I have overcome the world, so take heart. That is the message we have. So Jesus truthfully identifies our humanity, sin, troubles, problems everywhere, but offers hope. In him, and that's our message, the gospel message from resident aliens to the whole world, I have overcome the world. This is the way you can live and move into the future. As residents in this world, the church shares all the troubles of the world. Will you put up the uh, scripture from Revelation chapter 3? So here's one of these letters. These are the words of the Amen. I need to probably look at that one, not mine, so that I'm in the same translation. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know that all things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, now hear the contrast here. You say, I am rich, I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. You don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to go buy gold from me that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. And also buy white garments from me so that you will not be ashamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love to be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. A letter of correction to the church at Laodicea. And so here's a church that thinks everything's fine. Got what we need. Got money in a bank. Got health insurance. Got a retirement plan. Got an IRA or whatever it is. Life is good. And the letter comes along and says, you don't see the real situation you're living in. You are naked. You are poor. You are wretched. You are blind. But Jesus comes and says, I stand at the door and knock. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, let's go there. Once you were not a people, Hear the contrast now? You weren't a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere silver and gold, which lose their value. Now I want you to think with me in these last few moments I have to the empty way of life he's describing. I can't think of a better way to describe the culture that you and I are soaking in. It's aimless. It's immersed in media and video games or whatever else. The symptoms of this are all too obvious. There is just unimaginable drug and alcohol abuse. Well, what do you do when you're not fixed on a place where you're going or should be going? You get caught up in all of these things. Anxiety medications are pervasive in our culture. Depression is predominant. Suicide are at rates we've never seen before. Crime, violence, and greed is everywhere. And the world comes along with a false message of freedom. Pursue all that you can be and want to be. But it is a self-defined freedom. Find yourself and then you will be free. No, Jesus says, if you want true freedom, it goes like this. Freedom isn't about you. It's about you finding your identity in Christ. And so Jesus gives us the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, heart, soul, mind, and, and uh, way. And honor your neighbor. Love your neighbor as you do yourself. The Great Commission. Love God. Love your neighbor. There you will find freedom. We choose to interpret, for some strange reason, a freedom that is defined by pursuing all the selfish things in this world that is to offer us. I beg you, don't go there. There's no freedom there. It's bondage. Your freedom is found in submitting your life and your way to Jesus, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. There is freedom. So from beginning to end, our identity is conformed to Jesus Christ. And when we compromise that to fit anybody else's agenda, we uh, betray real freedom. In Matthew's Gospel, they could put it up there, but it's a little lengthy and my time's running out. Jesus asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? He responds, well, some think you're a prophet, some think you're like Jeremiah. Others think you're like John the Baptist. Well, what about you? Jesus is quick to respond. Who do you say that I am? And Peter boldly says, you are the Christ, the chosen one, the Messiah. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus tells Peter, Peter, you didn't figure that out. My father in heaven revealed that to you. And on the basis of that statement, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I will build my church. You're a part of that church here today. And the gates of Hades will not be able to stand up against this presence, this church. This is a rock. This is a solid ground foundation. The church of Jesus Christ, our identity, our calling, our mission is good news. In the same context, he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom are to bind those who need to be bound, the sin that is at loose in our world, and to set free those who've been bound by it, but also to bind the sin up so it cannot spread spread any further. One more scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, if you'll put that one up. We now have this light shining in our hearts, 
But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars. I don't know if you feel like that on any given day, but it's true. Jars containing this great treasure, the gospel in other words, this makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. He has given us a gift. Faith in Jesus Christ, life after death, salvation, love, peace, joy, all those fruits of the Spirit, they are ours. Jesus provides these. That confirms our identity. We leave with this challenge. I'm going to ask you to go home today and perhaps several times during the week. Read 1 Peter chapter 2 to confirm this identity, what you were, but now what you are in Christ. Confirm it in your heart and in your mind. Lord Jesus, we are not of the world, but we are in it. And this calls for wisdom. This calls for discernment. Help us to see the way in which the world is sinking its claws into our existence, tempting us, forcing us to conform to its agenda rather than to be transformed by the renewal of our mind in his name. Lord, help us to be wise. Help us to be discerning and to do the hard things that are maybe not natural to our humanity, but to do the hard things that conform us to you. That is the identity we strive for. May it be true of us. I pray this in Jesus' name.
to this land yet we are in this land so if this is your first time or a few times or or decades we are a community the encounter church it's a building but it is the people that are here and, and we want you to be part of our community not to live a life that's isolated and alone but to a, live a life that has identity we care about your burdens we know that we struggle too those of us up front here we struggle you struggle, but we struggle together to overcome and become victory. So, so join me as we pray, as we are a group of aliens praying for God's guidance. Join me. Father, we, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the, the truths that were so clear for us to understand. We separate those things from the culture and the world that we live in because there's no hope in those values. In the values that you have, oh Christ, you call for us to, to care for each other, to love each other. And sometimes we are the givers, we are the givers of hope. But Lord, there are many times, many of us are in dark places. We don't know where we're at. We're confused and we're without, without purpose. Oh God, we know that's not what your plan for our lives are. As we learned this morning, we are to have a joyful, purposeful, eternal hope. And that God, you don't want us to, 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 to sit idle. But Lord, we don't need to do this by ourselves. We do this with community. We do this with each other. We do this with, with the teachings of truth. And thank you for the scriptures and the, that we ground our foundation as Peter talked about earlier. So thank you for those that have been here this morning. Empower us as we leave this building, as we face the challenges, we look for opportunities, but Lord, lift us up. Father, encourage us to talk to others around us. Help us not to just hide these things deep within our bodies. Help us to grow closer to you because we become, we, we know our nakedness. We know that we are, we are full and we have sinned. But Lord, you are our hope. In Jesus' holy name, I pray these things. Amen.